So good morning. My name is Chris Rogers. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering up at Tufts, and I run a center that's really trying to get engineering into schools uh, with kids. But what I wanted to show you today was some of the work that we've been doing by trying to um, um, give kids a different way to learn. So playing around in particular with cameras and, and a Lego brick or two. But first, I wanted to say what it is that I mean by engineering. What are we actually trying to get kids to do in the classroom? And I sort of see engineering as three different steps, teaching kids how to frame problems. That is, how to figure out what it is that they want to solve. And then once they've gotten there, how to build a path to getting a solution. And in building that path, they have to know something about math. They have to know something about science, about art, about constraints, about budgets. And once they've defined that path, then they have them start to go down that path and realize that they're going to fail and when they're going to fail and how to realign that path so that they will ultimately succeed. So a big part of our work is to try and teach failure. So uh, that's right. So one of the things is, is when you start bringing engineering to the classroom is instead of everybody going for the right answer, the way we measure the success of our programs is in the diversity of answers that we get at the end. So a highly successful engineering class means everybody has a different solution. This means that instead of everybody trying to get my mental model, I get to learn from all their mental models. And was what, what was one, at one point cheating is now collaboration. And this is a great example that LEGO does all the time with six pieces, build a duck. And you can see just how many different ducks get built uh, by any one group. So in particular, what we're trying to do in our classrooms that we work with are three different things. One, to convince people that kids are natural engineers. They love to build. They love to create. They have no problems with failing and iterating. They do it all the time on the sports field. They just don't do it in their second grade class. The second is that teachers are a key part of the equation. So all the stuff we do involves the teacher. We want somebody there that knows the students, that understands the culture of the students, the background of the students, knows how to pair students up. But also, we want teachers that actually spend most of their time listening to the students and not necessarily telling the students their mental models, but listening to the students' mental models and building off of those. And the third is how we build the classroom up makes a huge difference. This classroom here is very much a passive one where you're sitting listening to me talk. Wouldn't it be cool if instead we had tables all throughout there and you guys had Lego bricks on the tables and there was a la laser cutter in the corner and a 3D printer and you could actually do some of this stuff that I'm talking about. So that's what we do up at Tufts at the center. I do want to point out that, like Jeremy, I figured I'd try some new technology to show my slides only. Uh, this is one that I wrote, so it might crash at any time. So get ready for the embarrassment. So one of the things that uh, all the research shows, and we do a fair amount of the research side, which I won't be talking as much about today. Uh, it's led by David Hammer, is really that there is no one right way to teach anything. So anybody that has the solution, the box, that's going to teach science or engineering or whatever, that's not the type of thing we're going for. The second thing is we really want to see places where education is based on science, not based on hunches. So we tend to often teach based on a hunch of what we think is going to work or not work. There's a lot of science out there in how we learn, how we memorize, how we retain facts. And we want to see that science being used, just like today it's being used in the medical world, where science backs up the medical side. We want that to be on the uh, education side as well. So there's a couple different ways you can teach. You can teach like I'm doing now, which is you can lecture, you can give demos. There are people that do this very well. You can draw pictures. Um, but you want to mix it up with as many different other ways as you can. So for instance, one of the ways uh, that we do a lot with is teaching through um, investigation. So give the kids, in this case, an IR camera. How many people here have played with IR cameras? I highly recommend them. They're great fun. right? So give a kid an IR camera, and they see the world completely differently. That starts all sorts of of discussions about the world they're seeing, whether it's the uh, chicken and where the chicken is well insulated or not well insulated, whether it's a, a shadow of a handprint of a hand that used to be touching the window in this case. This was taken by a 10-year-old. Um, and Or looking at a sofa to see who had sat in that sofa earlier. Or heat transfer, looking at how the temperature changes with time. Uh, we do a lot of work with a group called Expeditionary Learning, where this idea of trying to give kids expeditions, and through the expeditions, you learn your, your math, your science, your English language art skills all together, uh, is a very powerful way to not only learn the material, but to retain the material. A lot of our work at the center is around teaching by building. So people that aren't necessarily good at expressing themselves in words express themselves with what they build. Hammers are an excellent thing to have in a classroom. We do a lot with Lego in developing uh, Objects like this. In fact, one of the things that we ask is that you build something that moves, but doesn't necessarily move. <laughs> it's alive. Uh, move with wheels. This is a great example of it from a group at the University of Zurich. 
They came up with 63, I'm sorry, 43 different ways of moving forward. Same program, same hardware, but you'll notice the diversity of solutions is huge. And I'm going to turn this poor guy off. Some of these, these guys move very effectively. Um, and some of them not so much. But the neat thing is the learning that happens getting to this point. So asking each other for help, having distributed expertise across the classroom. Someone might be very good at the programming. Someone might be very good at the construction. And giving kids a chance to do authentic problems where you, the teacher, don't know the answer to it. This is my favorite. He tries so hard. <laughs> And the other one that I mentioned earlier, which I think is very important, is doing more teaching by listening. So listening to the mental models that children have or adults have in their head and make them validate those, uh, those models, make them argue them. And it's hard if you're one teacher with 30 kids. So maybe it's not teacher to kid, but maybe it's kid to kid. So can we come up with mechanisms where kids can explain to each other? And so one of the ones we do is using stop action movies. So build me a movie that explains the concept of temperature. So this was done by some high school students up in New Hampshire. And in making the movie, you make them do it as teams. They're moving physical objects around under a real camera. And they're arguing back and forth about what is the best way to explain their mental model. And of course, they're refining their mental model along the way. I figured just so, just because we can, uh, we can try and actually just make a quick uh, movie. So we have a camera up here. So I'm going to make a stop action movie to explain my way of how people learn. So you start by you have a thought and you have some knowledge and you build on that knowledge and maybe you, you can build completely on that knowledge, it gets a little bit bigger, but then you actually take a leap and you don't really know everything, but we do this in academia all the time. Um, you don't really know everything, but you know some of this stuff and, and that leads you all of a sudden start to feel a little more confident about it to take another leap and you go a little bit further out. And, and then eventually you'll notice that uh, your whole mindset kind of falls over. And so maybe you need some, something to go back and do a little bit of research. Um, and you build up a little bit of research about some of the knowledge that's underneath all of this. I've never made a movie in front of a bunch of people before. It's just very nerve wracking. And then you take that support and you try and use that support to buffer up your original idea. And it straightens out. And now you have a great idea. So that is what I would love to. <laughs> Oh, wow. Hey, thanks. Uh, and then, of course, you can play it back. And you can see it. And you can change the frame rate so it can build fast. And what you find is that kids now are really excited. And they're sharing their movies with their friends, their aunts, their uncles, the whole world over uh, YouTube. And no one has ever done that with their essays before. So just changing how you report your models can actually change the engagement of the kids. This is an example of us running about, it was about 100 kids in Singapore decided they wanted to do Sam uh, stop action movies. So this was a competition. It was amazing what the kids were able to produce and the questions the kids asked and the way they validated their ideas. So I'd like to end with two things. One, sort of a list of what it is that I think is important that I try and teach in all my classes based on a lot of the research that we've been doing. The first one is teaching kids and adults how to be curious. It's amazing how many kids that are five years old say why all the time and how few adults ask why. How do we change that? Once the people have this nugget, if they want to find something out, how do we teach them how to learn on their own? Whether it's going out on the web, although I wouldn't recommend going to Wikipedia today, you won't get anywhere, um, or it's actually doing an experiment. But then once you have this knowledge, how do you validate that that knowledge is correct? How do you reflect on the knowledge you have? And then how do you transfer that knowledge to other situations? So these are the things I think we should be teaching, not just in engineering class, but across the board. And what you find is these are hard to, uh, to test. Uh, with standardized testing. It's pretty easy to test if you actually have to build a robot that stays on the table. The research that we're building off of this at the moment is really how do we identify the beginnings of engineering in kids. So what causes kids to stop following directions and start engineering? What in the classroom? And what in the classroom causes kids to, to stop engineering and start following directions again? And how can we build up a library of that? In particular, we're looking at kids building what they read in books and using the book as a rich source of information for their particular engineering design problem. My final movie I want to show you guys is how you can throw all this out the window and create a world, perhaps, where, where Newton was wrong. And so these are, these are my boys and a guy that works at the center that decided one rainy afternoon that they had to make a movie that violated all the laws of physics. Uh, so this is a camera pointing down in the gym. And it takes a picture every, every minute or two, so you get yourself in the new position each time. Uh, <laughs> 
What's amazing about this is the discussions that happen in making it and the retention of the material, how long they will still ever, forever remember whatever they were, it is that they were trying to film. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> so that's all I have. Thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to the rest of the talk. Thanks. <laughs>